So ladies and gentlemen, dear researchers, dear colleagues, dear all, uh, it is my great, great pleasure today to welcome two distinguished lecturers. First of all, Professor Andrea Bianchi, who has been a friend for years now. I dare not say in decades, but nevertheless. And, <laughs> And so I'm especially happy that he has accepted to come and discover the Institute for the first time, but not the last. And he promised, so I can tell it tell this publicly. And uh, together with him, and in order to interview him, uh, Dr. Surabi Ranganathan, that I'm delighted to, to meet again. We met some years ago, then not decades. And uh, <laughs> when we had to collaborate on the Cambridge Companion on international law, and it was already a pleasure, and it's uh, even more a pleasure to, to be able to, to welcome you here at the Institute, and, uh, and, and the same, I hope it, it's not for, for, for the last time. I'm also happy because we inaugurate today our new conference room, and so uh, and it's our first lecture of the year 2017. And in order to introduce our speakers, I will give the floor to um, Luca Pasquet, who has, uh, together with me, initiated uh, this uh, lecture. So, Luca, you have the floor. Thank you, Alain. Okay, thank you very much, Alain. It is for me an honor to introduce today's speakers. Um, our event, this event, will be structured as a conversation, as an interview. So, the two speakers will interact somehow. And, um, we have here Professor Andrea Bianchi, who is the author of International Law Theories and Inquiry into Different Ways of Thinking, the book which will be the main object of, uh, of this conversation. Andrea Bianchi uh, is a full professor of international law at the Graduate Institute of Geneva. He was previously full professor at the Catholic University in Milan and associate professor at the University of Parma. His publication addressed topics which range from uh, human rights to uh, jurisdiction and uh, the law of, of immunities, uh, counterterrorism, et cetera. And in the, more recently, in the last year, his research has focused on uh, the theory of international law. Maybe we should say the theories, and we will hear maybe what he has to say about it. And Professor Andra Bianchi will dialogue with uh, Dr. Surabi Ranganathan who is lecturer at the University of Cambridge. is also a fellow of the Lauterpacht Center for International Law of Cambridge. Uh, she studied in Bangalore, New York, and uh, Cambridge. And uh, I'm sure that many of you, of you know her as the author of the book, Strategically Created Treaty Conflicts and the Politics of International Law. Um, I'm very happy that they accepted uh, the invitation of Professor Ruiz Fabri and uh, I will give them the floor uh, with pleasure. But before, uh, allow me to, to conclude with a personal note. Um, because this, this book uh, that they will discuss today, International Law Theories, is largely based on a course that Professor Andrea Bianchi has taught for many years in Geneva. I don't know for how many years, but I know that in 2011, uh, I had the privilege to attend it as a student. I was in my first year of PhD. And uh, I can say without exaggerating that it was very formative and, which, and that um, it completely changed the way in which I look uh, at international law. So I would like to thank him here for this. <laughs> but um, I'm particularly happy that he found the time and the energy to write a book in order to make the content of this course available to a broader audience. And I'm very interested to hear what he will say, what you will say, you both will say about this book today. So thank you very much again for being here, and I give you the floor. Well, good evening. I'd like to begin by thanking Professor Ruiz Fabri and Professor Bianchi for the opportunity to be here on this wonderful occasion where we'll be discussing Professor Bianchi's new book, as Luca mentioned, International Law Theories. Now, the book is subtitled An Inquiry into Different Ways of Thinking. And it is, in fact, in fact exactly that. Professor Bianchi, in this book, asks us, as international lawyers, to open our minds to ontologies and epistemologies that are beyond the doctrinal. 
and he offers us a collage of approaches that have been taken towards international law, from constitutionalist to policy to critical, laying bare their genealogies, the contexts in which they arose, and some of the challenges and critiques that they have been faced with. And he alerts us to some of the best work that has been produced in each of these approaches. Also, something I found very helpful is that you find ways of bringing these approaches into conversation with each other. Thus, for example, we might be brought to see that not, although the origins of the New Haven School and the Helsinki School are quite different, the projects they've spawned are quite different, there are elements of resonance between them. At the same time, we also see that even though there may be elements of resonance, we should not confuse the two for each other. They may be quite different in their politics, for example. International law theory deserves and will find a very broad audience, including amongst those who look at international law from the outside. So, so to speak from the perspective of international relations, or critical theory, or economics. And those who wonder about the possibilities of engaging with international law as a subject, as a field, and as a discipline. But, and perhaps I speak here as an international lawyer, it seems to me, most of all, a book that is addressed to us, to, to our invisible college, as they call it, asking us to, you know, it's on a mission to broaden our curriculum. And that's my first question to you. Is that how you would conceive of the project of this book, as trying to broaden the curriculum of this invisible college? Um, possibly. Um, I felt the urge um, that we had to engage with theory. Um, and we had to be curious. So I think the very origin of the project was to spur curiosity. Uh, spur curiosity in what kind of audience? Um, anyone who might have an interest in reading this kind of publications, I mean, we must give up on the illusion of uh, writing for a large public. We are academics, so um, we can aspire to have uh, a few dozens of, of, uh, of readers. Um, but I think that, you know, uh, graduate students, uh, colleagues, doctoral students, uh, they might hopefully find it uh, of interest to, to just look at how in international legal scholarship, um, you know, there are so many movements, schools of thought, methodologies, um, and I found it fascinating. Uh, the origin, the historical origin of, the <laughs> of, the, of my interest in this kind of things um, dates back to I can't trace it exactly, but it was the uh, end of the years 2000, when I started teaching uh, a course on uh, the making of international law by its scholars. And that was a failure because nobody was interested in uh, such uh, in an appealing title, so I just got a handful of, uh, of students attending the course. And then uh, if I am telling the anecdote, I think it's because there is something to learn there. Because then, um, after I was heavily criticized by my assistant at the time uh, for my uninspired choice of title, then I changed it into international law methods. And I made another mistake, because I found out, but I wasn't aware at the time, um, that the idea of method or methodology brought, um, carried with it this idea of something that you can actually practically use and implement um, to do things with. And I suspect that also the American Journal Symposium of 1999 might have been responsible for that you know, loaded connotation. So I wasn't happy either with that title. And then I had another go, and I called it appro Approaches. And then finally, I landed on theories. And theories turned out to be more appealing than other titles sometimes for the wrong reasons. But um, I think that the main catalyst for me was to invite uh, my colleagues um, of all ranks, I mean, to engage with theory, to be curious, to spur also, and that's a word that is not very often used in law, but reflexivity try to ask ourselves questions about what we do uh, and why we do it in a certain way. Because there are different ways of looking, and that's also the subtitle of the, um, um, of the book, which I think um, conveys uh, appropriately this, this urge that I felt um, at the time. 
Well, actually, that takes me to the next question. So, you know, what you're saying is very interesting. You taught this course for many years. And one of the ways in which this might have evolved into a book out of that course would be for you to have delegated the task of writing the individual chapters that you've, you've written in this book to different people. It would also get around some of the problems you said about, you know, the, the loadedness of using certain language. Each of these theories has their own language. They have their own internal conflicts and that sort of thing. And yet you chose to write the whole in your own voice. Can you say more about that? Hmm. You pose difficult questions. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know uh, why. Why did I do that? I suppose I was interested in doing it. Uh, it was my own psychotherapy, perhaps. Uh, it was a way for me of confronting myself with what I had been teaching, right? Mm -hmm. But I had. Um, an incredible amount of work to do. Um, so it's true that I capitalized on the experience of teaching the courts. But then when it came to writing the book, I felt utterly inadequate. So I started reading and reading and reading and reading, trying to put myself in the shoes of each and every movement. <laughs> and sometimes it's not easy, but I really wanted to engage. And so it was also fascinating. Maybe I was simply selfish because I wanted to write it all uh, on my own. Um, and what I wrote, I think, and then I told the publisher right away, I'm not a textbook person. I'm, I'm just not the right man for the job. What I can do for you is to write some short stories about how I look at all these different movements and schools of thought. Um, and you might notice that there is no um, two chapters that have the same structure. All, uh, all these chapters are different. So it's a representation of how I look uh, at them. Um, and um, you know, I try to do different things, uh, presenting whenever this is possible or appropriate, the genealogy of the movement, uh, the main tenets, um, possible critiques. And I incorporate it, um, and I emphasize different aspects depending on the specific characteristics of the movement or the school of thought. And I think that's the answer to your question, because to have commissioned chapters to representatives of these movements uh, would have probably led, besides the nightmare of dealing with edited volumes, uh, but on top of that, would have led to a self-representation of these movements by their own representatives, which is an entirely different exercise. Um, so I decided to, to do it on, on, uh, on my own. Also because I was very fascinated by this intellectual journey, and I think uh, it's been a great uh, experience, uh, although it was a violent one, because all of you who know what to write a book means, I mean, it's violent exercise. It takes time, it takes energy, uh, you have to impose discipline on you. And I wrote it all by myself from beginning to end, or every single footnote, so all mistakes are my own. <laughs> um, but it's violent, but then uh, it was a fascinating journey. It's great. And you know, one of the advantages, I suppose, of writing the whole in your own voice is that you can convey subtle appreciations and judgments of each of the theories that you're dealing with. In and I think there is one thing, if I may, uh, it was difficult, that decision, because this was a very peculiar uh, book, and I didn't know what kind of narrator I should be. Mm -hmm. Should I be the external observer, you know, uh, making value judgments, saying, okay, this is good, this is bad, um, this is, uh, you know, thin, this is heavy, this is serious, this is scientific, rigorous, and so on and so forth. I didn't want to do that. But that posed the problem in terms of the narrative thread. So I tried as much as possible to use the first pronoun, I, it's me who tells the short stories. But then it was also difficult to find the right pitch, because whom are you going to talk to? And I was very naive at first, because I started out with this idea that I would uh, speak into a large public, but again, the public is very tiny, so I realized very soon uh, on, the, on the job that I was talking to my fellow colleagues, to you, so I had to find uh, somewhere in between. But it's, I think it's a, it's a very, it was very instructive to me to wonder what kind of narrator I should be and what kind of, of pitch, uh, uh, what kind of voice and kind of pitch I should use. 
Well, you have a wonderful sentence. You quote Stanley Fish, who says, we are never not in a situation. And I think the book recognizes, you try to sort of, you're quite reflexive all the way through about the situation that you're in, in terms of how you're dealing with these theories. Which is why it led me to wonder, is it fair to say that there is a preference, a subtle preference in this book for certain types of theory over others? So there is a pushback against what we might call traditional or mainstream theories, and there is a, an effort to bring to light more critical and normative theories of international law. Um, I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> I'm sorry that it came across this way. Uh, it wasn't meant to uh, at all. Um, I suppose it's natural that you know I am who I am with my personal history, with my experiences, with my preferences. Um, so I think this might reflect uh, in the book. It might pop up in a variety of ways. But this was not at all intended to be an exercise against, uh, not a pushback against traditional, or what I call traditional methods. Uh, or approaches, which was a nightmare in and of itself, and that's the last chapter that I actually wrote, because I didn't quite know how to put together different strands of thought. So I resorted to this known legal category. Tradition meant as a certain commitment, um, you know, the certain worldview and um, you know, reiterative communication in a given context. The tradition which is also handed down from one generation to another, which was exactly the tradition I had inherited myself. So that was quite difficult. But it wasn't, uh, it isn't a uh, pushback. But I thought uh, it was a mirror. Uh, it was a mirror, not to everybody, but to most of us. And that's why I paraphrased uh, Lewis Hankin's famous uh, statement, uh, which goes, you know, uh, uh, almost all nations uh, respect most international law most of the time. And I refer to these approaches as international law as is uh, taught in most law schools in most countries most of the time. Which is very unrigorous, which is very unscientific. But I suppose that many of us would readily uh, recognize ourselves with that kind of, of, of tradition. Um, and I think that it, it has a very strategic purpose, because the mirror allows to acquire awareness uh, or of, of the water in which we swim, uh, most of us swim. So it creates a means of contrast. It's like when you have to, be, to do a scan or an x-ray, and sometimes you have to swallow all these means of chemicals, these means of contrast, or they inject them to create a better imagery. So then that was the purpose, but it was not intended at all um, as a pushback. Well, which then brings me to the question of where then in the various alignments and interests that you describe in the book would you locate yourself? So, and, and has there been a trajectory? So has there been an evolution or change in that? Hmm. This is a very tricky question because I suppose I wrote these books in the attempt to avoid that kind of questions. <laughs> um, to be tagged to be put a tag and then explained and set aside. So I try to be a chameleon of sorts, uh, trying to put myself in the shoes of each and every movement and believing in what I was studying. Uh, and there is one reason for this, because this is an exclusionary mechanism. Once you can say that somebody is this or that, is a critical scholar or is a black letter lawyer, uh, it's done. You make a caricature and you set it aside. And that's precisely what I didn't want to, to, to happen. So um, I hope uh, you find it difficult to categorize me. I did, I tried. <laughs> and I try to, um, of course, I've got my own history. I come from you know, a very positivistic, black letter, uh, international law environment. That's where I came from. Um, and then I changed. Primarily just reading, just being curious. I can't say that there is one or you know, a particular figure whom I found inspiring. Sometimes people, they think I'm a critical um, scholar, which I take it as a compliment. But then they, they are absolutely surprised by the fact that I haven't studied with Duncan, uh, with Duncan Kennedy or David Kennedy. Uh, so they make the next obvious association. Oh, yes, but you hang out with uh, Martikos Kenyemi. No. Um, 
no, I mean, that's what I've come to believe. Um, I've changed, I'm still searching, and I hope that my position keeps changing because I feel and interpret my job as trying to explain what's going on in good faith and looking at the social processes that I look at. Um, and, you know, this is the, uh, something that is subject uh, to change. Well, you mentioned, I think, that you tried, uh, you know, over the course of your career, on two or three occasions, you made very distinct theoretical forays, and immediately people tried to co-opt you into, into that yeah, field. Yeah, Could yeah. you say more about those forays and, <laughs> you know, who was co-opting you and what that says about the <laughs> battle lines uh, and causes of international law at those times? Uh, no, I mean, assumed or Dios, definitely won't get names. I can't possibly <laughs> say that. But I found it most interesting, isn't it? I made a few incursions, um, and like uh, with everything else, uh, in, you know, in a very amateur-like fashion. Yet, you know, there were all these colleagues and famous ones who would make contact and try to recruit you. Uh, and at first, you are flattered by this because, of course, you know, there is somebody who shows interest, and there's somebody who's famous, and they want uh, you to adhere. Uh, to espouse, uh, to follow in the steps. And then they immediately lost interest when they realized that I, you know, I wasn't there you know, to be recruited or hired as a believer, uh, simply because I didn't believe. Um, I've used law and economics in my early days to try and to understand better uh, the economic consequences of choosing different regimes of responsibility in environmental liability regimes. Um, at some point, I found it of some interest the New Haven approach um, and the idea of Lord's process. Um, I made a, a little very amateur-like incursion into law and literature to react to a certain way of doing international humanitarian law. But I wasn't interested in espousing the cause or sharing the beliefs. I think that all these different uh, movements are interesting, uh, but I'm not ready to identify myself fully with, which I think is a good occasion also to convey another thing, which I think is very important. All these, again, theories, uh, approaches, whatever you want to call them, they are not interchangeable. Uh, it's not that you can substitute one for another. No, sometimes these are not theories <laughs> in this self-contained a grand vision of the world kind of thing, they ask different questions, they observe different phenomena, they have a different sensibility, so it's not that they are interchangeable. Um, and I think one, why not, could make use of different sensibilities at the same time without you know, uh, buying the uh, uh, ticket to, to be a member of the club. Right. You know, that's interesting that these are very different approaches, yet sometimes they seem to have resonances. As I said at the beginning, there was, you know, there's this sense in which you might read both the Helsinki School and the New Haven School as concerned with the ethics of the decision maker, for example. Is that the sort of link we should not be drawing, or should we be more attentive to the fact that they actually do have quite different politics and they focus on very different questions, or should we look for these resonances where we can find them when we work with these theories? Mm. I suppose what I attempt to do any time I teach, and I think I suppose I did it also when I wrote the book, mm -hmm. was to create a space of freedom for the reader or for the listener. And I purposefully refrain, and because I took entire passages out of the book at the end, to draw analogies or to make comparison or to bridge and all that, because I wanted the audience and the reader to do it freely. <laughs> and to see for herself what she is ready or prepared to see. Uh, not imposing on, uh, I'm sure that there are perhaps, you know, some places in which I haven't done it and uh, it's still visible. But this is uh, freedom, freedom of thinking freely about things that most of the time we are thought to be rigid, uh, fixed, set in stone. Um, but there are incredible resemblances and resonances across, across the board, I find. And in terms of, so you talk about how the, their politics might sometimes differ. Is, do, they, do they have resemblances and differences in how they conceive of the economic and the social as, as categories as well, and what they place in those, those concepts? Definitely, uh, definitely. I think 
because it is the position that determines um, how you look at things. Um, so I think that there is a very different idea, even of the category political. Um, as um, you know, lawyers trained in uh, this traditional approach, I've been taught that politics is bad, uh, that politics shouldn't come to contaminate the purity of the law. Uh, which is a fairly stunning thing if you think about it, because politics with a capital P is about you know, how the community is governed, it's about the fundamental principles, the decision-making processes. So I, all, I was always a little bit uh, uh, circumspect about people wanting me to believe that they shouldn't meddle with this and stick to the rigid forms of the law. So that's one way uh, of looking at uh, at, at, at the political. Um, and then if you look at other movements and schools of thought, and you take, I don't know, uh, critical legal studies that conveys the message that law is politics, so that there is nothing <laughs> in between, and one is the other, and they are the two faces of the same coin, uh, which most uh, would find upsetting, but I think we should be ready to consider and then you may you know, make up your mind and, and decide what to do with it. Um, but definitely each and every movement uh, looks at all these categories that you mentioned in a different way. And what they have in common is that they all believe that their way is the only way of doing it. Right. I mean, there's one, the, one of the wonderful things about the book is you also see the movement of actually individual scholars as they move through more than one of, you know, the, through a multi series of these approaches. But there's also a second movement that's traced, and which is the movement of, of international lawyers between scholarship and practice, and how those, you know, sometimes inform each other. Can you say more about that? You call them, call it the, the, call them the twin sisters, and can you say more about that relationship and the ways in which it's productive for international, uh, for thinking about international law? Yeah. If I can take up the first uh, prong of your question, this is not something I set out to do purposefully, but then I realized I had done it because I probably found it interesting. Uh, this idea that international law and international law thinking is about people, and uh, that these movements and schools of thought, they do not exist independently of the people who think, the people who put certain claims forward. Um, I think it was David Kennedy who came out with this uh, very evocative image, and then um, uh, Koskinemi subscribed to it as well. International law is people with projects. And I find it very interesting, this idea, um, that it's, it's people, it's not abstract entities or spontaneous phenomena. Uh, no, it's people who have certain convictions, ideas, uh, beliefs uh, and to try to carry them forward. So I think that's a very important element. That's why I indulged um, as much as I could also, you know, personal histories and, and personal intellectual uh, trajectories and, and, and uh, itineraries. Um, now, the other aspect of your question. Uh, the interface between theory and, and, and practice. I, I'm not sure I, I would generalize what I say about traditional approaches um, to the rest. I made the point in the, the traditional approaches uh, chapter that oftentimes the social practice of international law and its scholarly representation coincide, or at least, I use this expression, they, they look like twin sisters, mm -hmm. which I think it was fairer than saying that one is the handmaiden or the other. And by that, I want to simply to emphasize that there is very little distance, very little reflexivity in um, traditional approaches. Practice is justified by theory, which is justified by practice in a mutually constitutive process. I think that theory and practice is a much more com complex uh, relationship, I think. But I wouldn't say the same for the different um, approaches that I have analyzed. Um, these remain two distinct activities. I think that to do law or to think about law um, is not one and the same. And they should be kept distinct as much as possible, which does not mean that one person can be an excellent practitioner and an excellent thinker. 
It's the activities that are different and they have different purposes, different functions and different constraints. Constraints, I think, is key to understanding. When I act as an academic, I act under constraints and then we may write another book about what kind of constraints do academics operate under. But when I act as counsel before the European Court uh, of Human Rights, my mandate is different. Uh, I have to defend a certain claim, I have to persuade uh, a court to do or not to do certain things. So it is different. And I, what, what I abhor is caricatures. It's the caricature of the practitioner who says, you know, a theory is absolutely irrelevant to what I do. Um, as if, you know, the practitioner doesn't act on the basis of theoretical presuppositions and methodologies, or, which is very current, and there's self-criticism, the academic who does what I called in other, in other contexts armchair theorizing, you know, rolling in the chair and saying whatever, uh, completely removed from the realities the law is meant to regulate. That's bad <laughs> scholarship, I'm sorry. But it's not that this is scholarship. No, this is bad scholarships. People don't realize that law is a social process, and you know, if you have to think about it, you have to take into account what's going on uh, and what kind of purposes the law serves or doesn't serve. So, but I find it a little bit uh, depressing uh, to experience many times in the profession, you know, this uh, characterizing the, the the two activities. Both are very serious activities, and they they must be performed in a professionally competent way. Um, and I think it would be healthy if thinking about the law uh, is a distinct activity than actually doing, doing law. Um. Yeah, and that's interesting also because when you think about the ways in which theory and practice have come together, it's not even just in terms of the traditional theories, but if we think about uh, from apology to utopia, it's the product of, uh, you know, Marty Koskinemi's practice where he has a certain sense of how he sees international law working and then he sits back and tries to write about that and that was, I suppose, quite, quite productive. Conversely, you have, the, I think, the third world approaches to international law. You have the, you know, the practice then being really a mirror for people, you know, for ideas that were developed first by academics about redistribution and economic justice and how it might be filtered through through international law and then actually finding their way into uh, general assembly resolutions and, 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 you know, other documents. So there are, I suppose, even for critical legal studies broadly, there are these interfaces with practice that don't get quite taken into account. Is that would that be right to say or? I'm reacting instinctively to something you said about uh, Marty Koskinemi, and I'm sure he might uh, say it's not true what I'm saying, but what I thought uh, I understood uh, by reading his words is we all believe that Marty Koskinemi uh, was inspired or was led astray, depending on who says, um, by critical legal uh, scholarship because he did his doctorate at Harvard because of the proximity with... Uh, David Kennedy. I think well, at least what he wrote and what he said is that his idea that international law had an open-ended argumentative structure uh, predates uh, his intellectual experience of it. It was inspired by his experience as practitioner, working as a lawyer at the foreign ministry of Finland because he wasn't diplomatical. And it is there working in New York that he realized that international law would allow arguing one way or the other, often you know, opposite pairs, opposite diets. And that's what probably got him intrigued and interested. And of course, he picked up on the indeterminacy theory that intellectually had been um, elaborated within the movement of critical legal studies, and there is no doubt that from apology to utopia is a manifestation of that particular sensibility, but I found it most interesting that Koskinemi doesn't seem to me, or at least in uh, light of what he writes as well, it doesn't start from the intellectual reconstruction, it starts from the practical experience. And I think that's also what has made him well accepted by the Corporation of International Lawyers, uh, he could not be set aside as one of those intellectuals thinking from an up, uh, you know, the, the ivory tower of sorts. Um, and then he evolved uh, because um, I devote 
one chapter to his uh, to his contribution to scholarship. Quite you, you christened the Helsinki School. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that that's that's tricky. I didn't want to name uh, to to mention names uh, as chapter headings, and sometimes this has been very difficult because the Helsinki School. Oh, come on, be serious. I only analyze. Uh, Koskinemi's work there. But then I was very lucky because I bumped almost haphazardly into the book that Jarna Petman and um, uh, Jan Klabritz had uh, edited for uh, Marty's uh, 50th birthday. Apparently that's a German a, a Finnish tradition because I think Jan Klabritz got one too. I thought there was nothing to celebrate about it, but anyway, so it's a, a Finnish academic tradition. And there, uh, both Jana and Jan made reference to the Helsinki School. So I thought I should go for the Helsinki School and that I wouldn't offend anybody because they themselves came up with this idea. But I didn't want to make it too personal. And then another one which was difficult was the social idealism in which I primarily discussed the work of Philip Allet. And although there is a distinguished tradition of social idealism in international law, it's clearly that you know, its most um, influential representative is Philip Allard of these days. If I can plug another new book, his book Utopia has just uh, been published. <laughs> uh, so, okay, but to come back to, so this is interesting. I mean, one of the things you say also about this relationship between theory and practice is that I suppose this revolving door between academia and practice produces a sense of investment in international law. Um, but again, I was thinking about critical legal scholars, and one of the things you point out is that even within a lot of the critical legal schools, there is a dissonance between those who actually are quite invested in international law as it is, who think there's need for reform, but who see the possibility of reform, and others who think that you know there needs to be a much greater, more radical change, and international law is not actually, as it is, is not the way to you know achieving the ends to which it's projected. So can you say more about that dissonance and how it runs through different schools? I think that's a recurrent uh, tension. Um, I would not pin it down to critical legal scholarship. I think that's a very deep concern that we all have um, uh, with, you know, with sway constantly from the two opposites. Mm -hmm. We have faith in international law and we look at international law as an emancipatory project, as something that can enhance um, humankind, the state of humankind. And sometimes you lose hope, um, and all of a sudden we start having the suspicion that international law might be part of the problem rather than the solution. Uh, this is palpable uh, in certain movements like third world approaches to international law. Um, one way of looking at it is to reconstruct different epochs or different phases in the in the development of TRAIL, uh, with the first generation of TRAIL scholars being part of the system, um, deeply believing that the system might actually bring about the independence, the dignity of third world countries. And then the disillusionment with the process uh, and the realization that international law might have been responsible for the state in which they found themselves um, I have this one line that I often use um, by Tony Engi, who's a, who's, a, who's a dear friend. You know, international law uh, did not produce colonialism. International law is colonialism. Um, and in Twail, I think there is still, uh, nowadays, there's almost insoluble, uh, you know, a fluctuation between the two extremes. Should we use international law instrumentally? Can it be used? Is it in our hands? Um, and I think that that, that is a, a tension which characterizes so many movements, feminism as well. Uh, it swings constantly um, about hope and despair, um, acknowledgement of the irremediable character of the male-oriented system of international law, and, you know, hope of reform, uh, mainstreaming uh, as a policy within the United Nations perhaps might bring about more gender equality. So I think that that tension is not just confined to critical legal studies. Um, 
Uh, it's almost everywhere. I was thinking of Marxism, and China may well has that line which says the chaotic and bloody world around it is the rule of law. So yeah. it's the back to the, you know. I think that's a very powerful thing to say, particularly to people who naively believe, and most international law students I know, even in an advanced uh, level, uh, I consider myself as a student. So we believe uh, that international law is a force for good. And then uh, Surabi made reference to this statement by China Mieville, whom you might know as a science fiction writer more than an international lawyer because he didn't go for an academic career, but he wrote an excellent PhD thesis at the London School of Economics between equal rights. And he has this very crude image uh, that I always you know, uh, convey and, and tell, particularly human rights advocates. Uh, what you see around you, the bloody reality around you, is the rule of law. And that shocks, it's an image that is shocking because we associate the rule of law with, you know, the righteous uh, calls, uh, fair processes, uh, human rights, good rules. And then if you look at the state of the world, that's what you get. Um, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit drastic as a remedy, but it's an eye-opener. It has to be taken with a grain of salt, of course. I think it's a great eye-opener. And, and also, again, within something like the, you know, the Marxist tradition, there are others like E.P. Thompson who said, but the rule of law is an unqualified human good, and when was seen as you know, having betrayed his fellow you know, Marxist comrades. So it's quite interesting that that tension is, again, reform versus you know, you know, revolution. Yes, and I think that Marxism is a special case in the collection because Mar uh, Marx uh, never dealt with international law. I mean, it's not, uh, that's not what it is about. But some of the concepts and the categories and, uh, uh, and, and the forms of reasoning are used by Marx and um, you know, uh, the people who uh, came later and uh, who were inspired by him, they do provide uh, a wide array of intellectual kits, uh, intellectual tools, um, toolkit, so to speak, from which one can draw interesting inferences, the dialectical method, which has been used extensively by other schools, critical legal studies, just to make an example. Or another thing that I found very inspiring is this idea of false necessities, um, um, which has a Marxist pedigree, although I don't think it can be fairly traced back to Marx, but rather to Lukács. Uh, this idea that many of the things we see and that we consider to be inevitable, or to be inherent in the order of things, that, that they are necessary, they are not. <laughs> it's a false necessity. And then it rang uh, a bell uh, to me as an international lawyer, how many things we take for granted. And we are trained to believe that that's the way it is, that Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice provides the list of sources of international law. That kind of false necessities, things that look inevitable, that look uh, rational, that look um, necessary, and they're not. And at the same time, Susan Marx has introduced this notion of false contingency. To, Absolutely. To, yeah. Which is an equally clever idea. Many of the contingencies that we experience are also false. <laughs> they're not the product of, of, of you know, uh, circumstances that were inevitable. No, we created this. Mm -hmm. So it's a false contingency. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's a great thing to play with this concept because it's like using a kaleidoscope and if you turn it a little bit, what you see is dramatically different. The forms and the colors. And I think that's what uh, looking at these theories should encourage. You don't have to take lock, stock and barrel the whole thing and adhere and become a believer. You know, just steal, uh, be curious, um, don't be afraid of borrowing things, provided that you can put them to good use for understanding, in good faith, uh, what you look at. When, one of the things that, you know, you were talking about the fem you know, feminists earlier and there's this sense of, you know, anxiety as well. And that's, I found that quite interesting because you ascribe that anxiety to this question of w whether feminist scholars can think of themselves as a group. 
and then I was interested when you were discussing twail in your in, in the book, you look at how maybe that sense of anxiety is actually not present. So twail is often critiqued from the outside as being a group of scholars who don't actually represent those they speak for. They tend to be from quite elite institutions. They have studied often in the West or are teaching in the West and li write in languages that don't seem uh, you know suited to to the, the those who they're, they're talking about. So could you say more about how the anxiety sort of you know, percolates through one group but doesn't seem to come into another group and the stakes of that? Hmm. I think that's the most noticeable feature for trail scholars, that's for sure. And I think there is a point in discussing it because trail scholars at some point were accused but also raised the issue by themselves. Who are we? Uh, what is our legitimacy to speak about the oppressed, the have-nots of the world? Because if you look at who these third world scholars were and still are, most of the time you have people who come from certain regions of the world and uh, sometimes from the global south, but you know, uh, who are rather more fortunate than others. They have started in Western universities, um, you know, they're academics, so, are they entitled? Do they have the legitimacy to speak about world injustices, uh, the global south, poverty, uh, international law is colonialism? What are these people talking about? They work for that system. They are at the service of that system. And I think that can be quite upsetting. Um, and I try simply to relay the sense of unease and the anxiety that comes with it because I, I also have friends and colleagues who are like that, so uh, it ripped off of me. I mean, I have to absorb uh, part of this tension. And I think it's, I don't have any particular answer, mm -hmm. but the issue of the identity of a group is often essential, particularly for those movements who advocate particular things for a particular social group, like feminism, one of, the most intractable debates uh, in feminism is that about essentialism. That is, is there a condition of womanhood that can be uh, presented as, in the abstract, as the essence of being a woman? And the feminists have you know, uh, quarreled about this. And, uh, but I think that the necessity of creating identity is partly related to the very specific kind of claims that are uh, put forward by a particular group. Um, another question, and this has to do with, so, um, you know, recently a Cambridge professor of social history unleashed a Twitter storm. Uh, and this relates to actually something you said about being brave and being able to look beyond, you know, what you know and looking at other ways of analyzing things. He said, uh, post-truth and alternative facts. Today's leaders in the USA all imbibed postmodernist uh, relativism at university in the 1980s. So he's, in fact, he was trying to draw a straight line between post-positivist thinking and Donald Trump and his advisors saying that they're a product, they don't believe in fact, and they don't believe in objective reality because they're products of this sort of post-positivistic, post-modernist approach. What would you say to a critique like that? Because implied in that critique is that it's dangerous to have, to have you know, moved in these ways beyond positivism. Oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a Twitter storm. <laughs> um, I didn't know that, but... Uh... It does require a stretch of the imagination to make a link between uh, the peculiar features of the current U.S. administration and losing faith in facts and uh, positivism. I'm a little bit uh, suspicious about the reasons that may be behind this claim. Um, and I think it's not a responsible thing to say. I don't associate uh, what I see um, in the Trump administration as the obvious product of postmodernism. Uh, <laughs> quite the contrary. I mean, I think an equally legitimate claim could be made that if Trump and his uh, collaborators were postmodernist, they would have never got to do what they do because you know they would relativize uh, things. They would be more tolerant. They wouldn't believe in truths absolute truths, they would be sensitive to the other. Uh, where is this? And is this the fault of postmodernism? I'm not, I'm not sure. 
But I think, although I was not aware of this uh, fairly responsible statement, but I think... How would you it, tweet back to him in, you know... It makes, me, <laughs> it makes me think about a rhetorical tool which is widely used by anybody, I think. Uh, you know, this idea of the horror vacui, you know, the, 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 the fear of, the, of, of changing the status quo. So how I take that statement is, you see all this postmodernism has caused us to change our world, and that's what you get. Um, that's what I sense. And I don't agree with it, because most of the time when you get that kind of warning, when people tell you, and it could be your professors, huh? it could be us, um, you know, don't uh, be led astray by all these contemporary theories, stick to the tradition, stick to the old world. It's a choice. <laughs> it's a choice. It's not inevitable. It's a choice and there is always an agenda, which you may subscribe to and go for it, but please don't believe that it's, not, it's, it's an inevitable choice. Um, on postmodernism, more, more general, postmodernism, when I say postmodernism, I don't have a philosophical background. I take postmodernism to, to mean simply any narrative which is against any foundational statement. Okay? Um, it has to be taken with a grain of salt, like uh, everything else. I mean, uh, I don't believe in the streams. Um, you know, I think that reality um, is a different uh, sort of thing. It's much more complex. But to put the blame on, on, on postmodernism, I think it's, it does require a stretch of the imagination. Also because um, the reality we know and the intellectual lives we live and you live in particular, because I think thing, I believe things have evolved in the past few decades. It's a world which, in principle, has the potential for promoting creativity and imagination more than before. And it's an, okay, an opportunity to seize. But I wouldn't make that straight uh, causal link. I think it's, uh, if, it's done, if it's been done, I think it's been done for other purposes. And in fact, the fact that that kind of you know, blame game can be played is, is, is scary and dangerous in today's times. And I think that's why it's quite, a, you know, this is a, is a very important book because it, it flies in the face of that sort of you know, uh, argument that you know, he's made. I With, consider you know, it as a remedy mm -hmm. against intolerance mm -hmm. um, because I have seen, because that's something that we are not prepared to admit and so hypocritical. The academic, uh, scientific field, to use Buddha's uh, image, is violent. And people from outside have this ironic view that we are a peaceful bunch of people, <laughs> uh, that are putting forward our ideas, and we are competing fairly about who sees uh, things better. It's not. It's violent. It's a battlefield, and there are stakes in the game. Uh, and, and there are power structures in place, and there are conservative strategies, and there are revolutionary subversive strategies. There is a fight, constantly. Uh, so, and the fight, what is the fight about also in the academia? It's about the power of speaking authoritatively. I am right, you are wrong. So it's a violent world. And, uh, I don't like it, uh, or I don't like the violence inherent in it, so I thought that right, it's a very naive thought to entertain, but I thought that to write such a book where I attempt to show that, look, you've got, what, 15 different ways of looking and I have left so many aside. I mean, well, where's the truth? I don't know, but you must be tolerant if there is such a panoply of different ways of turning the kind of kaleidoscope. And these people are all serious people who sometimes have devoted their lives to try and explain from their perspective what's going on. Um, so it was in the intention of the author, at least, an antidote against uh, intolerance and perhaps also an invitation <laughs> to have that particular feeling uh, that David Kennedy brilliantly described once. He was talking about legal pluralism in an article of his, and he said, legal pluralism is when you, as an international lawyer, as a professional, you have that moment of vertigo, when you realize that what you think might actually not be <laughs> what you have long thought 
it should be, and that some other people or some other theory might be right, that moment of vertigo. And I think it's a very healthy <laughs> experience to have, uh, to take into consideration the other, the other perspective, the other author's view, the other world, other representation of the world. Because that moment of doubt, I think it, it must be the indispensable companion of any researcher. And occasionally it can cause vertigo, <laughs> but it's not such a bad feeling after all. Which actually brings me, in a way, to my final question, which is that you know, it relates to what you've been describing. And one of the things we are seeing today is this move across university campuses to, so, so to speak, decolonize the curriculum, to, you know, to change, you know, to, to think about the ways in which we teach and then the ways in which we learn and the, you know, how we learn to see the world. What would it take to actually bring about this curriculum shift in international law? See, you are also affected by your sensibilities uh, to decolonize the curriculum. Yes, that's true. <laughs> but that's, that's the movement. We the are all forward. prisoners <laughs> of who we are, where we come from, and I'm joking. But um, <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's a serious problem. You know, should we think about how to reform the law curriculum, um, how to make it what? richer, uh, to decolonize it, um, you know, to free it from the shackles of tradition, and uh, it depends on the perspective. But I think there are obvious ways in which this can be done, particularly at the advanced level, once uh, you have acquired basic legal training, and I think at the master's level, at the PhD level, exposure to other theories, um, and also, even in the basic legal education, many, uh, in many countries, uh, many curricula have been stripped off of courses like, I don't know, philosophy of law, sociology of law, courses that open up rather than narrow down uh, uh, your, your mental horizon and, and your horizon of freedom. So I think the you know, educational authorities uh, should be in charge. Um, but this idea to equate the law with something narrow, something that makes you only think of power and the exercise of power, um, I find it uh, a pity because law is a beautiful <laughs> social process that can be analyzed, can be looked at in many creative ways. Um, and you know, I think that any attempt to diversify the curriculum uh, should be good. Without, of course, because the ultimate challenge is always to preserve the autonomy of the discipline. Um, so I'm not advocating uh, the law becoming something else. Um, that's not uh, uh, what I'm calling uh, for. But to be curious, uh, to stick your nose uh, in other areas, I don't think it will do you uh, any harm uh, as, a, as, a, as a professional. Um, to spur your curiosity, follow the instinct. Go and investigate. Um, if I ever had any idea, uh, in my writings, most of the time uh, I borrow it from outside. And I think that's very important because it makes you realize that there is nothing inevitable. All these necessities uh, that we see around us in our loyalty world, most of the time are false. It's about choice. We have choice. And there is plenty of things to choose from. So I think you'd be a much responsible decision maker lawyer, professional, if you have this awareness that what you do is not Newtonian mechanics, that you're applying a set of rules to a set of facts. No, you're choosing. And if you choose, you must also be aware that you have responsibility. So you must take up responsibility. So that, that's the message. Great. And I think, I mean, you know, we were saying earlier that I, we wish we had had this book when we were studying international law ourselves as undergraduates. This might be quite helpful in, you know, how now we teach students. That's very nice conference. Thank you. Thank you. I think this might be a great point at which we open up to uh, a, a broader audience. All reaction or comments. So we invite uh, the researchers maybe. Some of them have read part of all the book, and so it would be welcome that you take the opportunity to, to ask questions. Do you have some? Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to know if you think that the role of the international lawyer changes if you are from a different school. And oh, Sorry, international scholar. So 
they all have different perspective, but is the role one role for all of them or do they have different roles? Thanks. Why did you hesitate when he said international lawyer, uh, no, sorry, scholar? <laughs> so that's two roles. <laughs> and I would use the plural, always. Um, I think that you know we can perform different roles in different contexts. It's highly contextual. Personally, I don't conceive my role as a mission. I, I, I don't like the word mission. But if you take New Heaven School, for instance, there was a clear sense about what an international lawyer should be doing. It should be there to advise the decision maker um, and to advise the decision maker to take a decision in the interest of human dignity. Um, so I think that all these different movements have very different ideas about who a scholar or an international lawyer is and what kind of function uh, should they perform. Um, I think it's uh, a question that each of us should answer uh, depending on what she does uh, in her activity. But whatever you choose, please do it responsibly. And don't ask me what responsible means. I don't know, but I think I, I can distinguish it. Okay, I, I had difficulties. I have an anecdote. It's, uh, I think it's uh, quite illustrative. Um, we had uh, Jan Klabbers uh, come to the Graduate Institute years ago. And as you know, Jan is committed to this idea of um, virtue ethics and its importance on international relations and international law. And the usual vibes that he gets from the audience is scepticism, no? Oh, come on, virtue ethics, what are you talking about? Um, and I was, you know, inclined to be sceptical myself. And then I went home, and a couple of days, uh, Luca Pasquet, uh, who's the gentleman uh, in the first row, wrote me an email, and he said, uh, the UN has just failed to uh, appoint Robert Mugabe as uh, UNESCO ambassador. Well, that's an example of what virtue ethics is about. You shouldn't. So it's very practical. It's not very abstract. Any other question? Thank you very much for this, uh, to Surabi and uh, Professor Bianchi. Um, my question uh, for you is uh, with regard to what you said about trying to not adopt any approach when you wrote this book, or to not show your, um, your position or your allegiance to any of these schools. But when you write about international law, let's say not a book like this, but outside of it, uh, how hard would it be to, I mean, how easy, sorry, would it be to really appear neutral? Because to me, uh, I don't believe anybody can, so your, your allegiances would come through one way or another when you write about the law. I don't lay claim to be neutral. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm the contrary of neutral. I have my own convictions. I tried not to show too much my preferences in writing this book. Who I am as a scholar, you can easily figure out, you know, if you want to waste your time reading what I write, but I think it comes out quite clearly. Um, you know, I'm a stratification of different influences. Um, that's all, but I have my own style. I have my own style when I write. It may be difficult for me to be squeezed into a category, but I am positioned. Um, I do have opinions. Uh, I do have biases. And I'm the product of my personal history. Who I am as a person, my personality, the kind of studies, of people I have bumped into into my uh, professional trajectory. So I am positioned, and I never, ever in my life like claim to be neutral. So, and I think uh, it would be difficult to make that association when I when you read what I write. But this book, I try to show. Look how many different ways of looking. Because to me, the key word wasn't the theories. It's the subtitle which is mine. International law theories is OUPs more than anything else. It's, for me, it's, uh, you know, it's the, um, the different ways of thinking. 
I have a question to follow on this, because you have also explained that you have acted or tried to act as a chameleon. So, of course, you, can be rid, you cannot be rid of what you are. So, you can, or a chameleon to a certain extent. And, uh, but uh, nevertheless, I mean, going further than this, uh, you can also, you also explain that there are toolkits in each theory. And uh, is, is it possible, in your view, to use these toolkits without buying the agenda and the objective of the theory? It's what the first step of my question. And uh, the second step is then there a risk of s syncretism and, uh, and, uh, and with the, the, the downsides of this and the, and the eventual setbacks? Mm, uh, you get a yes on all counts. I do believe that it's possible to take things from each and every of these theories or movements uh, without necessarily adhering uh, to the full agenda. And that's what has happened to me. I found interesting things here and there, um, and I've tried to use it. What you should expect if you do is people immediately try to tag you. Oh, but then you are a Marxist or you are in heaven. But I find this is a legitimate intellectual modus operandi. The risk of syncretism, I think I'm the closest you can possibly get to a syncretist, which is probably an offense in intellectual circles. Yeah, but I think as long as I steal things and categories and ideas from others, as long as they can help me explain what I see, I don't have a trouble with that, um, even if it doesn't make a theory or something complete. And your question makes me think of something, which I hope uh, you won't uh, take me as pretentious um, if I say so. But I went back, I have edited a collection of uh, essays uh, recently, which is going to uh, appear in a couple of months. One of those very cheap volumes that you can uh, purchase for one or two thousand uh, pounds. Um, but I wrote a, a substantive introduction to it um, on the theory and the philosophy of uh, international law. Um, and I felt so ill at ease because I'm not a philosopher and I don't even look at myself as a th theorist. Uh, so who am I? <laughs> and then at the end, I try to find a way to square this off by saying, you know, the importance of, of asking questions. Questions about the system, about what you do, who you are, where you come from, and so on and so forth. And in the, in the course of that exercise, I went back to uh, a very interesting read, which I would advise you to do. It doesn't cost much because you can uh, uh, download the PDF online. Edward Said, The Representations of the Intellectual, which is very... It's a great read. Uh, it, he takes issue with expertise, and he says, you know, we need more intellectuals. But intellectuals not in a very stuck-up, uh, snobbish way. Intellectuals equated with amateurs, people who do not belong to any school, to any particular uh, sets of belief, who are there just to ask questions about the big things and who look at the big picture. Uh, and they can't be reduced to expertise. So if you like, I feel more comfortable in a world of amateurs than in a world of experts and great theorists. Thank you. Um, my qu I have two connected questions. Uh, I would like to know your opinion. What is the role of the national element in this mosaic of theories. For instance, we uh, used to talk, especially in the field of history international law, of the Italian positivist school of international law, the French solidarism. I would like to hear if there is still a sense of speaking about this national element, if it's still, or if it is only nuances, or only shades of a certain kind of positivism or traditional approach. And the second question is, uh, if any role, the national element, if it has any whole role, uh, it tends to disappear. Thank you. Law has been for a long time exclusively domestic 
and it continues to be primarily domestic in terms of philosophy law. So yes, uh, the law that we know and that we've been trained at practicing, at thinking, is first and foremost domestic law. I only speak about what I do, so I had to confine my, you know, the things that I've said to international, because that's the world I'm more familiar with. And I don't know the extent to which what I say about international law could be translated or is the product of domestic law. I don't know. Uh, certainly, I think that most of us have been trained to think about domestic law, first of all. But I take issue with a certain tendency that for many years international lawyers have uh, indulged, that of trying to demonstrate that international law is like domestic law. Um, and I think that's an experience that many of us have had, you know, walking in, in, in the corridors of the law faculty, uh, coming across a colleague, asking you, oh, what do you teach international law? Ah, <coughs> uh, okay. But, you know, that's not really law. So I think that has generated an inferiority complex in international lawyers. And for many generations, we've had this wrong instinct to prove that international law is like international uh, domestic law or is evolving towards the perfection, the purity of the domain. I don't think that's a very useful thing to do. But most of our international lawyers' imagery is replete with domestic law analogies from the doctrine of sources, from the doctrine of subjects, and so on and so forth. I've always naively advocated to look at international law uh, you know, for its own sake and try to, to, to explain it for what it is. Uh, but the domestic sphere and the domestic dimension will continue to influence the way in which we look at law, that's, that's for sure. Because that's where our basic training comes from. And that's where our default settings are formed. <laughs> Any other question? When, when you started writing your book, did you have any other book as a model before you? Not at all. And I felt lost. And I felt lost and I didn't know what to do. And then I tried to say to myself, like, let's try and do what, you know, who you are and, you know. And I felt I should tell a story about Marxism. <laughs> But I had no clue, no, and I had no model. Um, and then even after writing the book, I'm s so terribly uncertain about what I've done. <laughs> and I feel utterly inadequate. Uh, and believe me, I spent a lot of time reading and trying to put myself in the shoes. And I still feel that probably I haven't done justice to many of these people, to many of these movements that are infinitely more serious and engaging and engaged than 20 pages can possibly account. So it was a very interesting personal experience, the, the, the drafting experience. Um, and I took it as an experience in, uh, in, in narrating, telling a story, which I was very passionate about. But I was also there with the idea that, mm, what am I doing? I mean, this is not something that people usually do. And there are some unconventional choices. You might have noticed that my epilogue is somewhat unorthodox. It's three lines. Um, but, you know, it's a genuine, authentic way of conveying that my only interest in writing this book is, you know, I want you to be aware of the water. And that's all. And then who I am as, a, as an international lawyer, you can figure out by reading what I do, by listening to what I say. But for the purpose of this book, the only concern was being aware of the water. Yes, but just to follow on the question, nevertheless, uh, you, you explained earlier that um, along your career, you used and jumped into some of theories in relation to a specific research. Have your ideas changed about these theories when you wrote this book oh compared yes. to your previous research and, and, and in which respect? It oh, definitely, yes, yes. Uh, that, that's what I try to convey when I say I still feel utterly inadequate because I had very simplistic representations of what all these different theories stood for. Um, 
And some of these are very complex. Uh, it takes really long time to understand what's the intellectual project behind. Just to give you an example, um, it's probably more for our generation, Ellen, but the very simplistic way in which New Heaven was discarded by you know, our mentors, our professors of previous generations, as you know, it's about politics. It's an irony of sorts, because New Heaven emerged as an attempt to give a scientific methodology to law, which was perceived as lacking a scientific basis. So it's the other way around. And it's so complex, it's so difficult, and I had to swallow all these thousands of pages by Lasso, McDougall, Riesman. But I felt I had to do it, because you have to understand what these people actually say. You can't say, oh, it's about politics. No, I mean, you had to contextualize. Legal realism was the substratum in which this could thrive. It was a reaction to the fact that people would say that, you know, a decision, a judicial decision, depends on the mood of the judge. They wanted to provide the law and international law and that with a scientific methodology that they borrowed from social sciences, because Laswell was a sociologist. So it's completely the opposite of the perception. Um, so the idea was that I wanted to understand, and I found some of these easier, probably because of my own predilections and predispositions. Some of these very difficult for me to absorb and even to understand, let alone to, to, to convey. But I felt throughout this exercise an enormous sense of respect. Uh, respect for people who think, who produce intellectual work uh, with which you may or may not agree, but they are entitled to respect. And when I react very violently is when I see people making uh, caricatures. Then I, I think it's highly disrespectful. And then, of course, I have my own predilections and I have changed my mind about some of these things. Um, I focus more sharply and I realize certain things. But the sense of respect, uh, this, this, is what this, experience, this is what I will uh, bring with me out of this experience. Because even if you don't like that particular sensibility, but there is so much thinking behind, and there is so much well, you need to understand. And then, of course, you may discard because it's not you, it's not what you think. But to make caricatures and, and to throw easy value judgment, oh, this is just. No, please, engage and explain me why this ought to be set aside. Actually, could I jump in and ask you about the process of drafting? So was there, did you have a plan for what, what <laughs> you would address, or was it very organic in how you, what no. you wrote when, or in what, you know, no. what sequence? When it comes to patterns, regularities, and schemes, I'm not a person, yeah. so I was very irregular <laughs> in all of this. But I understand that you, it's, the book is not, it, the chapters are not uh, in, provided in the order in which you wrote them. No, because that's right. So, right. so th there was a different order in terms of, and it was quite serendipitous how you wrote, when you wrote Marx, the chapter on Marxism compared to, say, critical legal studies, yeah. or did you always know you'd do one after the other? You're trying to project some rationality in all of this. Just trying to figure uh, out how you could write. There was rationality, except mm -hmm. in some places. Mm -hmm. um, it followed the somewhat uh, random order um, that I had come up with. Um, there is some logic, some, sometimes, uh, either chronological. I think you really need to speak about Marxism categories and ways of thinking before you can actually present I don't know, uh, critical legal studies. I think you have to do critical legal studies before Koskinemi. Uh, and before, co before feminism and, and, and third world approaches. But why law and economics and law and literature come at the end, there is no particular reason. The only strategic thing was about traditional approaches. Traditional approaches was the last chapter I wrote because I didn't know how to write it. Because I knew that people would tell me, and you yourself had this impression that the whole book was a pushback against traditional approaches, which wasn't. For me, it was just the mirror, but I didn't know where to place the mirror. Should I put it at the end? Should I put it at, at first? 
Um, so it was difficult, and then that's the ultimate choice I came up with, but I don't, it's difficult for me to defend it. Um, only in bits uh, there is some logic, uh, because some movements I think are instrumental for understanding others. But I wanted each and every chapter um, to stand on its own right, so you can read, I think, um, every chapter and, and, and understand it, hopefully, uh, in its own right. Um, thanks for a really interesting conversation. I was, I was, my question was also just about your representation of traditional approaches in Chapter 2. Um, and I, I really read your book as a reaction against uh, pragmatism and a strain of pragmatism in law that says there's not really a difference between what we do in practice and what being a good academic is and that they're essentially the same skills. I guess I felt reading that, I was just interested, um, I felt maybe you're a bit harsh there in that when I think of, Lee, at least in the Anglophone world, leading practitioners, they've sort of independently of their professional practices made significant theoretical contributions um, in their scholarly writings. Um, so, for example, James Crawford, if you were to read his Hague course, it's full of a lot of the theories you write about and he hasn't, I don't think he's confused being a barrister with writing his scholarly account of international law. I guess my question would just be, are you perhaps a little too harsh on the mainstream and their disdain of theory? Maybe I am, but I didn't mean it. Um, and I'm very struck at the fact that, uh, aren't you projecting something there on me that comes from you? Um, because that's what I get uh, most of the time. I, I didn't mean this to be an exercise um, addressed against practitioners or the pragmatist notion um, that may be prevailing in certain circles in the Anglo-Saxon world, with which I'm familiar and you know, with which I can even be associated with. So it wasn't really against, no. Uh, it wasn't the intention. And to prove my good faith, is <laughs> I will tell you that I have for years taught a course on international lawmaking, which was a critical course, a critical reading course, exclusively based on the writings and the legal materials of positivism, the International Court of Justice judgments only, the works of Fitzmaurice, Jennings, to show that these people knew perfectly <laughs> what they were talking about. So the critique was inside. So I find it ill at ease. I don't think that was not the intention because I have no resentment. Um, one of the things perhaps that I'm critical of is that traditional approaches, like any other approach, has a tendency to hide the presuppositions. But that, you know, it shares with others. But there is no killer instinct or personal resentment. No, not at all. Um, but I wanted to put together, and I think it's, an, and I believe, and I know that it's unfair, but um, traditional approaches, which is a lot <laughs> to, to squeeze into. But I think that's, you know, how most of us have come in contact with international law, so I'm sure we recognize certain things. And no, I mean, I, I don't have any personal issue, because when I describe at the end, like a phoenix, the idea that the intellectual foundations of positivism might actually be renovate, uh, renovated uh, and like the phoenix from the ashes, you know, being born again. It's not a hostile message. It's, it's again, a sense of, 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 of respect. Then probably, yes, I don't identify myself anymore with this and probably shows, yeah, that's inevitable, I think. Because again, I never present myself as objective. Please don't walk away with that sense. I'm not an objective person. Um, but there was no intention. So, But what I perceive, because I've been talking to people, uh, sometimes it's, it's not posed, but they project on me. And I receive criticism from law and economics people because they perceive the hostility, even from some of the movements that I will probably be close. So uh, it's very an uncomfortable position to be because whenever I, I touch on the nerves, on the identity, and that irritates. So 
and it causes allergies. If you would pretend that your objective, I would think that you are not the Andra Bianchi I happened to know so many <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Thank you, Len. Thank you, Professor. Uh, you discussed the different roles of international law academics and practitioners, and uh, you said that they could choose different schools of thought, but they should be responsible for their choice. Uh, so my question is, Besides being responsible for their choice, uh, what they should do in regards to the interaction be among these different roles, so in order to contribute to the prosperity of uh, legal, different international legal theories. Uh, who, who, who am I talking about? The practitioner, the scholar? Yeah, there are different roles of um, scholars and practitioners. I want to ask, uh, so besides being responsible for their own choice regard to different schools of thought, regarding to the interaction between these different roles, what they should do? Yeah, I think it very much depends on which hat you have on, uh, because I think the constraints are completely different. If you act as counsel, uh, the freedom is limited. You may decide whether or not to accept a case, but once you have accepted a case and you think it's the right because you know, uh, it conforms with your views or simply because you think it's your professional role to accept any case, whatever decision you have made, but please be aware of the decision. But then the constraints are enormous. So you're not, you're unlikely uh, to make fancy statements about theory or about law and economics if you have to convince a judge that your client is right. So that's one type of constraint. Uh, if you are a judge, you're always under a constraint. Uh, you need to be persuasive. Um, you need, in your judgment, to lay down you know, a plausible reasoning, which is adapted also to the audience to which it is addressed. If you're an academic, the constraints are different. Uh, but we are constrained. <laughs> we are constrained in many different ways. Uh, and there can be a, you know, a whole range of constraints depending on advancement in career. If you're a junior scholar, you may feel constrained because you may feel that you're not free to say what you actually think because otherwise you wouldn't make a career, which I sympathize uh, for. Uh, I find it a pity. I find that's not what uh, senior people should uh, teach their junior colleagues, but you know, that's a constraint. Other constraints I don't really approve of when I've, as I've seen, I've seen people writing, oh, this, I, no, not writing, actually not writing, because justifying uh, themselves by saying, oh, this I cannot say because otherwise I will not be appointed as counsel anymore or as arbitrator. Well, then I have difficulty with, because that's another kind of job. So if this is the kind of constraints on you as an academic, I have problems with that. But we are under constraints, constraints that are endogenous because that's who we are and what we have learned and what we know, so I can't come up with just anything. Um, but I think that the different constraints apply to the different profiles and different hats that, uh, that we wear. But I think it's very important for us to ask about our own constraints because it's useful. <laughs> To, to be aware, and I am constrained, of course, uh, just as much as you know anybody doing loyally work. But it very much depends on, on where you are uh, and what job uh, you are in. Hi, I just want to follow follow on previous questions. And um, talking about the positioning, your positioning, and that you're not claiming to be objective, and that some of us have perceived some th some hostile hostility towards the mainstream and the touching upon nerves thing, which I think are constructive because they help us understand our presuppositions. So to an extent, we're thankful of this exposure to that. But I I was wondering while reading the book whether it would be. Um, and I, whether you consciously chose not to be very explicit about your choices and your positioning, and whether if you had been more explicit, would this detract from the book, you think? Because I, I thought sometimes it would help me navigate better your approach on certain theories. Well, th first of all, thank you for reading the book. Uh, 
But if you read the book, I hope that you read the introduction. And the introduction, I hope, I was explicit enough in uh, laying down what the reasons for writing the book uh, were. Um, so I didn't make any uh, particular effort to hide. If I've done it, I've done it uh, unconsciously. Um, and that's an interesting thing in and of itself to reflect upon. So maybe it has happened. Um, but the reasons for writing this book and the shortcomings of it, uh, and it's my personal choice, I, and I said it at the beginning, so I did not present this as the ultimate truth about all these different schools. These are short stories that I, as a writer, decided to tell. Um, so I hope that people, uh, you know, uh, take it as just as an incitation, an invitation to, to go on their own and read and explore. Forget about me. Just think about, you know, you might have found it interesting, you know, to, 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 to have read something about Shakespeare and, and the Merchant of Venice and, and the possible uses that you can make of rhetoric in law. And forget about me, just pursue this. It was an invitation to engage with these kind of things. Uh, but I, I have no... I, I don't associate myself with the, with the mission or with the crusade as way in the, 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 the sword or the, or the saber. It's, it's not me. I'm not out there to proselytize or to convince you that the mainstream in which you've been brought is something that you should uh, completely uh, forget about, obliterate, and move towards new horizons. That's no, your choice. I think. So at the end of the day, would it be right to tell you that although you're not no neutral, you're not objective, nevertheless, you're an agnostic? Nevertheless? You're an agnostic. <laughs> I, d I don't think that came as a compliment. Uh, no, no, it is. In my view, it is. But, uh, <laughs> so it's absolutely not pejorative, at least. Yeah, probably. Uh, I don't have stakes in this, honestly. I mean, I don't, I don't try to convince of other things that please be curious. And then I made an effort to act as a broker between what I want you to be curious about and you. But I don't have stakes in this particular, particular game. Except perhaps, yeah, no, perhaps it's not true. I wish I had more curious people engaged in legal activities. Uh, people who are happy about studying law, practicing law, and a little bit more open-minded about the ways in which this can be done. While not you know, forgetting about the constraints that are always on us, but particularly academics, we are so privileged to be able to do things, to think about things, to be creative, please enjoy. Uh, if you can. And sometimes we just can't because we have a family. Um, you know, we, we can't just write things that would displease our ball. I, I understand this. But if we can, let's enjoy. In that sense, yes, I'm an agnostic. An agnostic who has uh, his own morality, though, his preferences and... Uh, but beliefs not so uh, ingrained, not so entrenched. And one of the things that I think it's a very, it's an antidote to that is precisely to be aware of this variety of, of I use this metaphor, and it's not a metaphor, it's a, I pointed to this, to a variety of literary exercises in the, in the introduction, including uh, Goodman's Ways of Wall Making, which I think conveys well this, this idea of mine. And please uh, have a look at how the world, even the legal world, can be constructed. And then make your choices. But don't think that it's something which is set in stone, that's the way it is. And uh, you know, make an effort and be curious. Curious is harmless, uh, curiosity is harmless. I think it's time to conclude, as uh, I can see nothing better than this invitation to curiosity. So I, I convey, I relate to all of you, and I also invite you now to, to share uh, uh, beverages and uh, a glass and to have more informal talks uh, around curiosity and uh, all what is worth curiosity. 
thank you very much to our lecturer, to uh, uh, Andrea Bianchi for playing the game and, uh, and for uh, Surabi for engaging so um, lively in, in this interview. It was not a completely easy exercise, but it was really, really fascinating and interesting to listen to you. Thank you very much.